Uh, just, just to save him the embarrassment of having to introduce, introduce himself, I'll introduce him. Um, I noticed that the audience is somewhat small, but I want him not to take that as a reflection on himself. Um, I look, when I look at the audience, I find it to be particularly distinguished, um, actually. Um, and um, actually extremely distinguished audience, so you're very fortunate. And they're very fortunate to have you here. Quite seriously, um, Milos, as you know, I got so much confidence in Milos that he's now the associate director here, and he's an associate director of research. And so he's in charge of appointments and promotions and, and um, productivity analysis, which is why everyone should pay due respect and due homage to Milos. Milos should also be paid due homage to because he is a great scientist. He's actually well respected all around the world. Everywhere I go and I talk to people, they know of Milos. Um, and he's done something very brave. Um, he's actually commercialized one of his products, the, the work that he's working on, which is not an easy thing to do. I'm full of admiration for him. It's a, it's a tough struggle to develop a, a product and get it out um, and get it accepted and get all the money that's necessary to do it. But it's a product that's based on very, very sound science, and it works. Uh, because I've met people who benefited from it, and I've tried it myself and thought that this is a rather pleasant experience in contrast to all the other electrical stimulation experiments I've been involved in. So uh, let's uh, give well, Milos a warm round of applause. <laughs> careful attention because he will be rating you afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. So today I'm, I'm going to tell you more about, I'm going to talk about the things that I have been doing for the last 15 years. And please do interrupt me anytime if you have any questions or um, suggestions or comments. So I always have to do this because I, as Jeff told you, I started a company called Life Bag. So I'm conflicted in many ways than well. So whenever you see this mind tag or mind move, uh, take with a grain of salt what I'm telling you. Probably I'm overselling it. So, so motivation, why do we do this? Uh, why do we do neuroprosthetic systems for stroke and spinal cord injury patients? And you know how all that came about is, I'll show you two videos and probably there'll be a couple of videos that probably will be helpful. So maybe you've seen this video. Happening again. The smile, they said. The smile. It's all tingling on the left side. On the, on the left side. The doctor said to breathe in, breathe out. Man in distress. And I'm trying. I don't know why this is happening to me. It happened this morning again, and when I left the hospital Monday night at then 12.30 in the morning. So now I'm taking a picture for an example of what happens. It's 6.43. My hand is hard to lift up. And to touch something, to touch my nose. Okay. That's a stroke. And um, so she apparently had a couple of them on that day, so finally she, and she was talking to her doctors and she was telling them that she had this problem and that didn't understand what was going on. So finally she takes my phone or whatever. She took the videos of herself and that's a gentle stroke happening to her because she can still move her arm, she can touch her face, uh, and you can see the slurring of the speech and how her left side of the face is kind of drooping for a moment and it comes back. What happens three weeks after that is something like that. So you have this individual, and you can see that his right hand, right arm, is 
long function. It's a typical outcome after a stroke. So Jennifer, who show, which works upstairs on the second or third floor, everything that she's doing with his arm, actually she doesn't for him. He can't move his arm, he can't move his shoulder, he can't move his fingers and elbow. And if nothing changes at the week three after the stroke, probability of you improving or patient improving the upper limb function is less than 10%. Okay. So what happens is they wait for some spontaneous recovery, at least that was the practice until recently. I will show you what, what has changed. And uh, you will see the patient can a little bit flex the fingers, and people get excited about that because, but you know, about two or three weeks after that the hand is like that. So that flexion of the fingers that he was able to do before is meaningless because he can't even open the hand, right? So here's some of the numbers. So these are the numbers. About 1.9 million people have stroke per year. These are new cases. And of course, there's a lot of people who live up with the, with the outcomes of stroke. 10% uh, recover immediately, not immediately, but completely 50% unfortunately die despite of all the interventions. And then you have people with different levels of disability. About 60 to 65% of individuals have the upper limb disability that you've seen in that gentleman. So why is upper limb very important? Because if you lose the upper limb function, you can't do things on your own. You cannot be independent. You can't bath yourself sometimes. Most of the times, you cannot prepare dinner or lunch for yourself. And then you depend on others. And because you depend on others in the duties of daily living, you essentially lose your independence plus the cost that you personally incur in the system are tremendous. There's another video. This is a little bit a uh, scary one. So, Hold your seats tight. Uh, but I want to show you spinal cord injury. Was für ein Gefühl muss das für diesen Vater sein, wenn er seine eigene Person fest aufhält? Wir sind auf dem Weg. Wir sind auf dem Weg. Wir sind auf dem Weg. Wir sind He's not moving, and I'm not sure. It's not because he lost consciousness. He's totally conscious. He just broke his neck, and all the commands from the supraspinal to the lower back and to, to his legs and arms are gone for good, right? So this is how the person looks like after such an event. So cannot use both arms, cannot pick objects, cannot manipulate them, and if you run through physiotherapy, occupational therapy, the best the money can buy. They may improve gently, and we'll show you some of the data, but fundamentally, they will not be able to use their upper limb. These are the numbers. The numbers are fortunately much smaller. It's 34,000 individuals, and this is how the distribution uh, falls, uh, falls in place. But what is important is that because they lose both arms, the amount of uh, effort they need for somebody to take care of them is much higher than in stroke. The strokes have the other arm. So they can kind of cheat. They can learn a couple of tricks how to do things with a single arm. With spinal cord injury patients, there's not, that option is not available. So when they lose both arms, they essentially are not able to perform almost anything activities of their life. So these are the costs. So even the spinal cord injury population is much smaller. You can see the costs are comparable in uh, in the amount of how much you need to care for these individuals. To give an example for spinal cord injury, you go cervical level, uh, the lifetime costs are between three to five million dollars. Okay? And of course, stroke is the leading cause of disability. So, many years ago, actually in the 70s and 60s, a couple of people came up with an interesting proposition that you can actually generate the action potential in the peripheral nerve by providing electrical pulse, low energy electrical pulse above the nerve, and by changing the polarity in the nerve, you can trigger the uh, sodium gated channels, the potassium gated channels, you can generate an action potential, and you can get the muscle contraction. You don't have to be naked to get a muscle contraction, but. Okay. And so the idea was the following if I can generate the muscle contractions artificially, 
and the patients who are paralyzed have their muscles intact. Maybe we go in there and artificially generate the muscle contractions, and if you can time, time, time them properly, you can provide different functions like hand opening, closing, locomotion, and other things. So that was in the 60s and 70s, and a few patents had been filed at that time, and from that time there was a whole push to design this type of technology, either being implanted in the body or being outside of the body. So here's an individual, and I'll show you this in a second, who essentially has on his left arm the neuroprosthetic system for grasping, and he's a spinal cord injury patient. He'll show you that he cannot pick an object without the help of neuroprosthesis, and then he will, by pressing the button on the right side, he'll turn the system on, he'll be able to lift it and manipulate it. So this video is about 20 years old or something, plus minus, 90. So you can see that he can't do it, now he turns on the system, he grabs the object, and he can manipulate it. So the vision 15 plus years ago, and in the minds of some people even today, is that patients who have spinal cord injury or stroke will not improve, so we will design the systems for them, and they will have it at home and use it to do things in activities of daily, so brushing their teeth, combing their hair, or whatever. They will use this technology every day, and they will depend on this technology every day. Now, and that's an orthotic application. So this is an implant version which was designed in Cleveland, which is called Freehand System, or there's this system which is called H200, which is designed by BIOS. Now what is interesting, when we were designing our system, we realized one very important thing is that most of the patients who are using that system actually are dealing with neurosurgeons or they're dealing with engineers like us and very little <coughs> interactions with therapists. Essentially, they will give them only a couple of hours of therapist time because technology is marvelous and it will do everything for them. So what happened was you have a lot of people who were implanted with this neuroprosthetic system, freehand system, which actually didn't use it. And the reason why they didn't use it is that they didn't, the, the engineers in neurosurgeon, the, the actual neurosurgeon. Step 9, room 131, therapy gym. Code elevation step floor 9, room 131, so what happened was they felt that this was sufficient. And technology, no matter, and many of you work on different technologies, you understand that no matter how good technology you design, you have to help patients understand how to deal with this, how to use it, and how to deal with all these idiosyncrasies that technology may have. So we came up with the following idea. Why don't we actually design a system? They're, they're all usually customized for the patient. And then we have a therapist which will deliver this therapy or help the patient work with the system and learn how to use it for about 30, 40 hours. And after that time, they will get confident. They will know how to turn it on. They will know how to put it on. They will know all those little things. And as we were doing that, what started happening is that some of the patients start recovering the voluntary function back. So this is 97, 98, 99. The neuroplasticity was now the buzzword which you hear on TV. I mean, you show the patient which is having these changes to neurologist. The neurologist will tell you, you know, you're, it's a, just a fluke. You have spontaneous, late spontaneous recovery, right? So four or five late spontaneous recovery later, we say, okay, forget about neurologist. We won't talk to Armin anymore. We'll try to do this on our own. And we came up with a proposition that this could be used as a therapy as a short-term intervention to recover as much function as possible to see how far we can take this technology. So how does it work? Essentially, like this is an example of a stroke patient, the stroke patient, everybody will essentially generate the command in the central nervous system. That command will go down to the spinal cord and go to the muscles that you target. In the case of stroke, you either have a damage in a gray matter or white matter, which prohibits you from sending that, generating or sending that command to the peripheral muscle. So this is what the electrical stimulus, what this neuroprosthetic system essentially does is the following. You put electrodes above the muscles that you would like a uh, patient to relearn how to control, and then you do the following. You ask the patient to imagine the movement, and that has to be purposeful movement and functional movement. It's not just flexing and extending the arm, but try to reach an object or try to pick up an object or manipulate it. And then as the patient is struggling to do that and imagining the movement and it's trying to move the hand or arm, which he or she cannot do it, you essentially fire the muscles, you generate the movement, 
And all that movement actually is the proper receptive uh, sig signaling channels and provide information back to the spinal cord and to the, to the cortex and ascension of the upper levels of ascension of the system that the task has been executed. And as you do this repetitively, in, out, and in, in, you know, day out, and uh, every day for, for an hour on different tasks, you essentially create a different pathway to send the command to the muscle to actually carry out the task. And the reason why that works is because the central nervous system is a distributed system. All control doesn't sit in one place, but it sits in different places. I'm going to give you an example. In stroke patients, in us, 85% of command for the right hand is sitting in the contralateral side, but 15% is sitting in the lateral side. So I'll show you videos in a minute. As the patient lost good part of the contralateral side, learns how to control his arm, he essentially does it with ipsilateral side, for this side, which is not damaged. And he learns how to do it, and as he's doing it, he's actually moving both arms, arms simultaneously and only later learns how to separate one task from another. Okay, so very important thing in the whole process is you need a patient who is paying attention, has the desire to do the task, and wants to learn how to do the task. You have a therapist who can motivate the patient in a proper way and select which task the patient should learn to do at that stage of the of their recovery because you cannot, it makes no sense to work on their fine motor control when they don't have a shoulder function. So you will work on their shoulder and elbow and wrist function before you will do pinch grass. It just doesn't make sense. So you need a therapist who will schedule that properly and also work with the patient to, you know, benefit from the little gains because you need to motivate. This is a long process and may look even boring. So in order to motivate the patient, you need to get some early gains fast. And as the patient sees those gains, then they get cooked and they go and do more of that. And of course you need an FAS device who, that will provide you with the fine motor control or complex movement control. We are the only people who, who are actually doing that and doing it in a very nice way without actually causing discomfort as Jeff said a few minutes ago. So this is the combination that you have. If any of these elements are not in place, you're not getting the outcome of the therapy. So this is uh, this is, for example, placement of the electrodes. So this is the, uh, just to show you how these electrodes look like and which muscles we target. So this is a front deltoid muscle. This is pectoral muscle. For example, for this type of movement, you have biceps. This is the finger extensors. This is actually finger flexors. So you can flex the fingers independently. And this is intrinsic muscles of the palm to give you fine motor control. This is, for example, reaching forward and hand opening. That's something that stroke patients have a difficult time doing. So you teach them how to put hand forward, open, grasp an object, retrieve an object. This is pinch grasp, it's fine motor control. This is lumbrical grasp, which allows you to pick a book or objects like that. This is a key grasp. And you can do bimanual tasks. So you can pick a tray and lift the tray and do something with it. Oh, pick an object, bring it to with the left hand, bring it to the right hand, pick up the right hand, release the left hand, whatever. So you're learning, especially this is relevant for spinal cord injury patients because they have both hands affected and you want them to learn how to use them in bi bimanual tasks. This is how the device looks like and essentially has 30 plus protocols, but I think it's 32 now protocols for different reaching and grasping tasks that we would like to train. This is the interface. And this is, for example, how reaching forward, hand opening, grasping an object, retrieving an object looks like. This is a young lady who was two years post-stroke and uh, just shows you how that would look like. And this has been, all these movements have been done with electrical stimulation and it's the prototype of the my move system that we now have commercialized. But the process and the protocol and how this is done is identical. So just for example, for this particular individual, I'll show you the data later. She, when she came, she had her arm like that. At the end of whatever number of therapy, she could pick an object and bring it to her mind. You had a question? No, okay. 
I just wanted to ask what motions are stimulated by FES and what Everything. other motions? That no, he's, uh, he's just making sure that can, because FES, no matter how sophisticated it is, it doesn't have fine control of the movement. So what the therapist is doing is making sure that the hand moves in physiologically correct way and actually in a way instructs the patient where you want that hand to go and what do you want the patient to do with the hand. So he is there, I mean, nor is there not to lift the arm because most of the lifting, everything is done by the, by the system, but just to guide where the hand should. So for example, when you're doing this task, the control of where the hand will end up is not very fine. So if you just leave it with FES, you may okay. touch it wrong or push eye or something and do something funny. But the therapist ensures that this is moving smooth and it comes to the mouth, right? So here's some of the clinical trials. This is subacute stroke patient population. These are the methods. This is a randomized control trial. You have two groups. You have an intervention group and a control group. Control group received one hour of occupational therapy. They had 40 sub-sessions and FES group 40 hours of functional electric stimulation therapy. And they were all shadow the master stages of water recovery, two or less, which means they were really not able to do anything with, with the arm. And Fugelmeyer less than 15. So when you look at the therapy books, and sir, you don't work with these patients. So if you want to do any other robotics therapy or you want to do any type of other therapy, they have to be 30 and above in order for them to qualify. So this is a group of patients that in our sites nobody actually works with them. Yes? How many OTs were like, doing oh. admitting this therapy? And a lot. Over the 15 years, there is... Oh, sorry. Thank you. How many occupational therapists are... The question was how many occupational therapists were involved. Uh, I was just putting a list the other day. Probably 20 plus individuals in different stages of the development. Okay, so here are the results. So we have 21 patients in this randomized controlled trial, 11 is in controls, 10 intervention group. This is this function dependence measure, uh, uh, self-care component of it. And it's looking, it's looking at feeding, how do you do bathing, dressing upper body, lower body, grooming, and toilet. Why do you do these type of tests, right? If you go to a clinician, the clinician is really, and insurance companies, they're really not interested in what is your ENG of the muscle, how much range of motion you have improved. That, that doesn't mean anything to them. What means, what is valuable to them is, can you do something with that hand in real life? So unless you are man, you're managing to demonstrate something on this scale in improvement, you have nothing to show. Right, that's a very important message. So all these nice videos, all these things that you have, do nothing for insurance or for the therapist or for the clinicians unless you're able to generate at least six to eight points change on that scale, which goes from six to 42, because this is a minimum cl clinical difference, right? So this is where our patients start. So this is actually your zero capability. So they start very low. And this is the after. This is the control group, this is the treatment group, and here the median gain is eight, here is 22 points. This is very coarse scale, so it tells you that this change is quite substantial. So here's another, for example, looking at the same scale. Here where the patients start. So this is a control group, this is a treatment group, more or less the same, and this is where patients end up in a control group, this is where the patients end up in a treatment group. So the difference is huge, you don't really need stats to figure out where you want to be. This is another test which is called Fuglemeyer assessment and this is for upper extremity. It's looking at the shoulder, elbow, forearm, wrist and hand function. It goes from 0 to 66 and clinically important difference is 6 points. So this is where our patients start. We always stress that this is less than 15 because nobody works with these people. And you can see some of them are actually 0. And this is where they ended up after. So median gain here is 0. And median gain here is 34.5 points. And as I told you, six is clinically meaningful difference. Now, this is interesting that every single patient has reached the clinically meaningful improvement. So here's the game. Here's the gentleman from the beginning. This is him after 40 hours of therapy. And by the way, that was his second stroke after which he received the therapy.
the moment is not perfect, but it, the difference is huge. Right? And the good news is once they reach some capabilities like this, they tend to keep them. As they work on the function every day in and out, they get better and better. Okay. I, I will skip conclusions because that's, you understand what's going on, so there's no reason to. Now, this is an interesting thing, third-party validation. So early in the game, we actually went to Sandra Black. You all know who Sandra is. And Sandra, rightfully so, thought, you know, this is some Serbian stuff. You know, I want to see what is this all about. <laughs> Can you give me the stimulator? Sure. So we got her therapist. We trained her. And she went and took the patient. And they treated the patient. And this is the results which they got. This big 300-pound uh, guy had the ball. And he came running like straight at me. It went horribly wrong. I, I immediately realized, well, uh, I, I have a broken face because my jaw was over here. It was so serious, they didn't know whether Andrew would survive the stroke. Well, we were fearful that we might never hear our son's voice again, or that he might not ever be able to walk again or use his hand or arm. If somebody has a high level stroke injury, probability of improvement is less than 10%. So basically with functional electrical stimulation, we are retraining function. One component of the signal goes to the muscle, but at the same time, we are also sending a signal to the brain of the movement that's being executed. They were saying that it would train the muscle, and, and my brain would obviously connect that pathway. Within months, we could see improvement. Very uh, encouraging, like, like we saw hope. It did wonders for me. It pretty much gave me back my arm. If it wasn't for the functional electrical stimulation, he wouldn't be what he is today. It definitely has made a huge difference for him. Dermal rehab and FES has been great for me. It, it's basically got me f from dependent to independent. So there's another, so there is another actually study that has been done here and Catherine Irving was part of the process with Debbie Haber. When the company launched the product, everybody was worried that, again, the Serbian thing, right? That this works in Miller's lab, but doesn't work in the real world. So they wanted to check with that actually, how, how would you translate this technology when you have the therapist who actually didn't like the electrical stimulation, didn't use it, or thought it was useless, because we have those as well, besides those people who actually believe in electrical stimulation. So we ran a little study uh, with the product in which patients were chronic. They were at least six months after stroke. The frugal mire was less than 19, so they're the same uh, patient population. They received only 20 hours of the mind move therapy. 20 hours is not the dose we recommend. We recommend at least 40 hours or more. But the, the clinicians of the company believe, let's see what happens in 20 hours and do we have the traction, does this make any difference for the patients, would the therapist like to deliver it, and what were the technical problems in delivering the therapy, maybe we failed miserably in translating this knowledge to the clinical use. And by the way, the, the minimal clinical important difference for chronic patients is five points on the Fugumar score. So this is what we got. So these are individual patients from 1 to 24. And these are the results after only 20 hours of therapy. So what we have is these two patients didn't improve. Actually, this one got worse a little bit. And all other patients have uh, experienced improvement. So about 14 out of 24 patients uh, had more than minimal clinically important difference with the half of the dose. So that was very exciting and that told us that we are doing the right thing. So the person who was leading the study was Debbie Haber, and these are her data, so I, I unlawfully stole the data <laughs> to show it to you, and I hope you appreciate it. But this is, I think she's publishing the paper with that. She's the principal. So this was another case which we like to show all the time. We have many more patients. We have 115 patients that went through the program. But this is Howard Rocket, and he was about 19 years after a stroke when he joined the program and he asked me specifically, will I improve? And I said no. And the reason why I said no, because he had therapy almost daily, 
by one of the best pulmonary therapists in, in, in the country for the last 15 plus years after the injury. So if she couldn't get anything out of him, I thought we probably won't be able to do anything. So this is after 20 hours. And you can see he's using both arms. That tells you that the ipsilateral side of the brain is controlling the task. Right? And that's his quote right here. And I think this was filmed by one of his relatives at one of the dinners. And uh, this is another video with him 60 hours later, and you can see he's moving the, the fingers. That's 19 years after still. So we didn't expect that, and we are delighted that it has happened with him. And he's been uh, an outstanding spokesman for the company and the product, and we are very, very happy to partner with him on that. Okay. I'll move into spinal cord injury patients. I'll do this one a little bit quick. Uh, any questions regarding stroke? Sure. Uh, so what sort of age, like there is a big variance, so do you have any predictions of which sort of patients do the best? Which? Actually, I have no prediction because we had, so the question was, are there any thing? <laughs> then it's keeping me in line and I'm delighted. So the, the question was, uh, is there any differences in the patients that you're treating that some of them are better candidates than others? Essentially all the patients, we never picked the patients. So some of them had uh, hemorrhagic strokes, some of them had ischemic strokes, some had stroke in their cortical area, some had it in PLSI, some of them had it in a subcortical area. So, and one of the, a couple of them had it in the brain, brain stem. So, we really didn't handpick the patients. So we, anybody who would come in who had a stroke, we would just bring them and work with that. And it didn't make any difference where in the brain the injury happened or is it ischemic or is it hemorrhagic. Because mostly people, when they do research, they do it in ischemic stroke and it has to be cortical. We didn't even, we didn't actually filter for that. So no, it can be any, any type of patient. Spinal cord injury patients. The reason why we work with them is because we started working with them originally and we got first good results with them. They're very different type of patients because yes, they have an injury to the central nervous system, but the injury is in the spinal cord. So the motor cortex and all this thing, brain stem are all intact. The injury is really the, the neck level. And similar type of randomized controlled trial, the only difference is by that time our REV became much more sophisticated, asked right questions, and essentially told us you cannot give them uh, you cannot ref not allow them to have what they normally receive, which is one hour of occupational therapy, because we know this works. So we would like them to have one hour of occupational therapy. So both groups have received best practice that we have, and then they had two hours break, and then we'll go, and control group will have another hour of occupational therapy, and the treatment group will have functional medical stimulation therapy. 40 hours of therapy, and they were all less than six months after spinal cord injury. They were incomplete traumatic C3 to C7 spinal cord injury patients. So here are the results. We had uh, 21 individuals, 12 in controls, 10 in, in uh, intervention group. This is the FEM score, so you're familiar with that one. Just remember, it's a six to eight point, points is a minimum clinical difference. This is how they started. This is how they ended up. Here is 9.5, this is 25 point. And uh, another scale, which is very important, which is called spinal cord independence measure, which is looking at the uh, feeding, bathing, upper body, bathing, lower body, dressing, upper body, dressing, lower body, and grooming. And the scale goes from zero to 20 points, and six points is change equivalent to one neurological level, which means if somebody was injured at the C4 level, after improvement of six points, he or she presents as being injured at the, at the C4. Six, six, seven level. If it's six, six, then it's six, seven. So this is where they started. You can see some of them had zero values. And this is the end outcome. So the change here is a three points. And here it's 12 points. So essentially, these patients on average improved two neurological levels. That's huge. So this is the patient number one. This is before. This is a difficult task because you have to open a hand and grasp the sponge. And the only way you can grasp the sponge is you have to control the force. If you cannot control the force, you cannot pick it up. There's no other tricks that you can use. And you'll see at the beginning she's not able to do it. And then following the therapy 40 hours, 40 sessions later, 
you'll see what she's able to do. This is bimanual, but we're just showing you one arm because of the time constraint, right? So that's her after. Lift it up, she'll go to supination, to pronation, and put it back. There's no electrical stimulation there, it's all her. So this is a difficult object, this is 600 grams, 600, 650 grams object and we want him to lift it in the middle and then you push it to the side to see how he's controlling his supinator, pronator and uh, that's a very difficult task. So that's the patient 40 sessions later. Same conclusions. So, would you like to know why this works? <laughs> what is the mechanism of recovery for SCI? Because for a stroke, you can guess it's plasticity, but if the wire is cut. That's the whole problem. The spinal cord is not wire, the spinal cord is also. So, the question is <laughs> I'm, I'm, as you can see, I'm a slow learner. It doesn't come natural to me. So the question is, okay, we understand why it works in, spin in stroke patients because it's a gray matter, but in spinal cord, you know, the connections are, are, are damaged. The spinal cord is, you know, 50% is a white matter, which is track, which is providing command down and upwards, but also you have a gray matter in the middle. So it's the same mechanism, and I'll show you in a minute how that actually works. Okay. So you remember that young lady? which I showed you the reaching task, which was all, the, the video was yellow and her hand was yellow with yellow tape. So that study has been done with her. And so she was two years after stroke. And this is what happened. Uh, when you take, these are the different muscles that we stimulated, and some of them we actually didn't stimulate. For example, first dorsal intercellus, we didn't stimulate at all. And if you ask the patient to relax the muscle, she was not able to do that. And when you ask her to contract the muscle voluntarily, there's no change in the firing. So there's always constant tone in the muscle, but there's no voluntary control over it. Five weeks later, the patient can relax the muscle and on command, it can contract and have voluntary control over it. What is interesting is, this is the unaffected arm, maximum, muscle, maximum EMG that you can get on that side, and the yellow is the EMG on the affected side. And you can see how that EMG increases, but it never reaches that level. Okay? but you get the voluntary control over time. Now, what is interesting, at the same time, the H reflex starts dropping down, which tells you that the tone in the system is coming down. So at the moment that the tone comes down and the muscle contraction is sufficiently strong to overcome that tone, you get a voluntary control, and from that moment on, the patient is able to use the arm and use the muscle. Now, this is the most exciting thing. This is the FDI. We never stimulated FDI which tells you that the brain learns, figures out that for this task, I normally use FDI as well, and the brain automatically starts firing it to complement the rest of the movement that we are actually enabling by electrical stimulation. So over time, the brain actually brings the whole pattern, the normal pattern of stimulation, that it, the activation of the muscles that it used before the injury in order to carry out and execute the task. That's a very important message. Okay, so she was not able to move the hand at all. At six weeks, I think it's about, yeah, six weeks, 
she was able to draw the circle, and you can see how that expanded over the week 9 and 12. Spinal cord injury. So we actually, because we also do locomotion, but I'm not going to show you that today, we actually took uh, an animal, uh, generated a contusion injury in the animal, implanted the electrodes, and then control group didn't receive anything. The group which received, and the, the, the treatment group received functional electrical stimulation for locomotion to simulate the locomotion uh, task. And then we <coughs> image the spinal cord to find out what is the activity in the spinal cord. So this is an interesting thing. Before the, before the treatment, after the, after the injury, uh, both, um, whatchamacallit, both the FES group and control group had on BBB score only one point. And after the therapy, after the intervention, the control group was at three, and these were at 10. That's huge jump in those who, who understand the score. Now what is, what is more interesting is, normally when you have a spinal cord injury, right, you keep them in an open cage because no matter what kind of stem cells you give them, no matter what kind of therapy you give them, they're not going anywhere, right? We had to change the cage, cages in about half of the period because they would jump out, run around, and fight. Actually, one of our rats was killed because of their fighting with each other. So uh, that was um, an interesting data point. So this is what's very important. Is these are the control group uh, animals. What we do with them, we essentially um, sacrifice them, we open the spinal cord, we image them, and when you provide a threshold level of electrical stimulation that will cause muscle contraction, this is the level of activity in a spinal cord you have in a control group, this is in a treatment group. This is two levels uh, of the two model levels, this is control group, and this is a treatment group, and this is a three model levels, control group, and treatment group. You can see the, the activity in the spinal cord increases by providing more of the input to the periphery. And the second thing, which while in the control group, it doesn't really change. And what is also interesting is how much of the information jumps over the spinal cord injury uh, level and goes to the, to the soft sensory cortex. So this is a control group, left and right side of the hemisphere, and this is the uh, treatment group. You can see that much more information is jumping over the site of injury in the treatment group. So not only that you increase and change the wiring of the spinal cord, but you also enable this command to go to the supraspinal levels and the bounce back and allow for the control from above. So there's another very interesting study which was just published a couple of months ago, maybe almost a year, is that they have actually demonstrated that in order for her to have a recovery in the spinal cord, the only thing that you really need is a proprioceptive the system to be intact. So what they did was they took mice, which were genetically modified, they didn't have muscle spindles, and they grow up and they figure out how to function without having muscle spindles, and then you cause them, cause a spinal cord injury on them, and no more, matter what kind of training you do on them, they don't recover. But those muscle, those animals who have muscle spindles, they learn how to recover the function. So that's an important one. And this is also another paper which is interesting, which they looked at the animal model as well. So they trained rats, I think it's rats, to perform very complex, like Morse code type of typing. And when they managed to learn that particular code, that's when they were fed. So it took them quite some time to teach the animal how to do this very complicated code. And then they went and they took the motor cortex out of those animals. And the animal had no problem going and executing that task. Then they took the, the other side of the motor, so they took both sides of the motor cortex and the animal was still able to go and perform the task, which tells you that the control of the hand or upper limb is not in the motor cortex, it's in much lower levels of the, of the system. However, you could not teach them a new trick, so they could not learn to perform a new task. So essentially the messaging is the motor cortex is used to learn new tasks, but not if you have an established and relearn task, it's packaged in the lower stratum of the, of, the, of the central nervous system. And this is what we probably are tapping with the functional electrical stimulation. A little bit about stem cells, because everybody likes stem cells. So if you provide electrical stimulation to the, the animals who have spinal cord injury, what you have is you have increasing proliferation of endogenous, uh, endogenous oligodendrocytes. And the reason for that, and that actually, actually promotes remyelination. And this is not our work. It's some of the people from uh, uh, what's it, John McDonald has done that. And the other study from John McDonald 
was uh, to demonstrate that when you provide electrical stimulation, you're actually preventing, um, uh, you're, you're delaying the progression of the white matter injury, which is also a favorable event. So, in the article that uh, Cesar and Mary Naga wrote recently, just published uh, a couple of uh, months ago, they tried to summarize what this therapy does. So essentially, this is what they said. It provides the close to accurate efferent and uh, efferent afferent inputs during the training, which is very important because that's the only way how you can do the training. Provides necessary rhythmical and spatial temporal organized efferent afferent inputs and ensures that synaptic connections are organized and operate according to the sort of topic max uh, designated function, which means that all the elements, essentially in, in simple translation, is you're providing a proper feedback, you're providing proper command to the muscles, and you're providing it in such a way that the brain is accustomed to receiving that and dealing with that. Okay? You're also tapping into phylogenically older structures of the brain, which means you don't have to retrain the cortex, you can retrain the lower structures like brainstem and help them relearn how to perform the task. It, pro it uh, promotes robust regeneration and replenishment of neural uh, cells, and it promotes robust regeneration repair of excess as well through remelination. And uh, what is very important is the learning process and engagement and motivational uh, component of the, of the learning is very important part of the process. And these are all the people who have contributed to this particular presentation. We have many more people who contributed to the overall project, but the work from all these people has been presented today. Okay? And these are the people who have funded us. So how am I doing time-wise? Time for eight minutes of questions. One question before we do that. You want to see what else is coming in the pipeline? <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Cesar. This, what you're looking at, is the same FES therapy, my nerve thingy, but brain-machine control. So he's using essentially one electrode to record the activity of the, of the patient, his intent to perform the movement, the device automatically detects it, and this turns green, it tells you that's what the patient imagined the particular movement, and then you will see how the electrical stimulation fired that. Very important thing is, we took the patient who failed to improve on, you know one of those who had no improvement? We took one of those guys, brought him in, connected to the system, 40 sessions later, he had minimum clinically important difference, improvement because of the brain machine. So all this is Cesar, I'm just... Uh, <laughs> Why is this important? Because when the therapist delivered the, the stimulation to the patient, they're kind of watching, they're looking in their eyes and trying to figure out what they intend to do. And they, based on that and their expressions, they gauge now is the right moment. And you may miss the right moment when to fire. For brain to maximize its neuroplasticity uh, capabilities, you need to find these things perfectly. And that's what the brain machine interface does. It figures out just before the patient wants to do the task. And if you fire it at the right moment when the patient expects it to happen, you enhance the learning process significantly. And we can publish another paper to demonstrate that this is the case. This is another thing that we're doing. This is a stem cell navigation of the electrical fields. So these are neuroprecursor cells that are naturally produced by the central nervous system. And here you can see by providing the electrical field, you can get them to go where you want them to go. So essentially the message is you can go to the ventricles of the brain where the stem cells are produced, you put an electrode in there, and you, the electrical field, you navigate them to go where you want them to go. And once they go to the right place, you can stop the thing, and through electrical stimulation or other therapy, you engage these neurons, to precursor cells to become oligodendrocytes, neurons, or astrocytes, and learn how to do the switching, grasping, ping pong playing, whatever. So, just that you see that this is not 
pure electrical field thing, but you can see that cell is working very hard to move in the right direction. Uh, that's very exciting. So we've demonstrated this on a dish. We have demonstrated on a spinal cord injury slice. Right now, we're putting electrodes in the brain of a rat or the mouse. And hopefully, by June, July, we'll be able to show you this on an animal. And if you demonstrate that, then you have started your company. And this is what Jose, uh, Vera, and I have been doing for some time. This is electrical stimulation of the, sorry, of the smile. But this is a particular type of smile. This is the smile that you cannot control voluntarily, which means it's not a CNN smile. CNN smile is the one which is social smile, but it doesn't show you that you're really happy or excited. But if you generate this, it's called Duchenne marker, then you're genuinely happy, and you cannot control these muscles voluntarily. They're controlled through the limbic system, right from the brainstem. So what we have done is, by stimulating these muscles and creating people to genuinely smile, you can change their mood. And we've done it in a couple of, in 15 something able-bodied subjects, that's very exciting. And now we're doing it in, in people with a severe depression, and we have a patient number one, and look great. And now David Alter is helping us recruit the patients and do this in the right way because we're just engineers and funny people and he knows the business of depression. So we're looking forward to that study and work with him. And you can find everything else that we do on the webpage. That's it. So I'm sure there's too many questions for three minutes, but Milos is still around. So come on, let's have one or two. For people, you can control the intent, but how do you do that with the animal? How do you know? For people, you can tell them try to move your arm. Right. So the question was, how do you control intent in an animal? Right in the rat study, there is no control. We force them to to walk. Right. But as the legs start moving, you can see that the animal kind of starts participating in this forced event, right? And um, that's it. So we can't. I, I cannot imagine what the rat was trying to accomplish at that moment in time. But we forced that locomotion. If they were engaged and they wanted to, to, to walk, that would be even better. But we don't know. Any other question? Yes, please. As one of your first study patients, you recommended 40 hours, yet you only did 20. Why? So the question was why we did only 20 hours when we recommend 40. Uh, the reason is the company and the institution wanted to see, because they are rolling out the product, and they wanted to see how the therapists deal with the product, how the patients deal with the product, and if that experience is meaningful both for the patients and the therapist and the, the, the whole concept. And, and also they want to learn what happens after 20 hours, because the only data we had was 40 hours data, right? So that's why they did it. Purely try to learn something out of that experience. You know, um, it is incredibly exciting, but it's also very obvious that the skill of the clinician using it is yes. crucial. If this gets in the wrong hands of people who are casual and don't really take it seriously, it could do a lot of harm to the, to the science and to the product. So um, it's really fortunate that we're here and that we've got a skilled, some skilled therapists to work on it. And obviously we're going to have to build a training program that's significant. Any comments about the success in building a training program and making sure that people actually come and get properly trained? Right. So that's a very important comment. So we are very fortunate to work with Debbie and Irene, who have been launching this product, and they've been training some other people in the institution to do that. And Essentially, they were as, as uh, how do you call it, um, conservative and skeptical as everybody else. So they slowly tried it and implemented it, and they applied their knowledge to the technology and how they can integrate technology in their therapy. And we had some really exciting results because Debbie and Irene are su supreme occupational therapists, and we're fortunate to have them. So what we intend to do, and what the plan is, to make Toronto Rehab the center of excellence for training for delivering mind move therapy. And Debbie and Irene and the team at Toronto Rehab will play the critical role in that step. That will 
happen as soon as the you know the, the intervention becomes accepted in a larger number of clinics and there's a need for that volume. So at, at the moment they are helping uh, as we are training some of the people, but we are in early stages of that. So we hope in half a year, a year this is going to be a normal event here at Trotter. Robin. Robin. Thanks, Milos. It was um, great to get to see your whole program of research, or a lot of your. I'm sure there's lots more going on too. Um, could you, I know I've asked you about this before, but um, do you, could you explain how the FES, uh, where the overlap is with FES and forced use or constraint induced therapy, the overlap and the divergences? Yeah. So the question from Robin Green was, where's the overlap between FES and constraint induced therapy, or where's the, the difference? So the, fundamentally, they're totally alike. There's no question about it. The problem with the constraint-induced therapy is that if you have no function in the in the muscle or in the joint, you cannot actually deploy it, right? And you cannot artificially create this proprioceptive feedback, right? With FES therapy, you can take somebody who has no function whatsoever and start training them and working on them to get this going. And once they establish connections between, you know, the muscles that they want to control and the cortical or subcortical structures that need this to move, you can graduate them to constraint induced therapy. But you cannot start with constraint induced therapy if they have no function whatsoever. So we had, for example, um, Howard specifically, he went through the whole process of getting the fingers back and hand function back, and then we put him on Alex's robotic system. And as he was doing that, he continued to expand his envelope. So we look at robotic technologies or constraint use therapy or other modalities of therapy as something that patients can use after they establish the connection and FAS will be instrumental in doing that. Also fine motor control, if the patient doesn't have control in the hand, we are the only ones who can deliver that robotic systems are not doing it, they don't have the capacity to do that. So once we get them, we recover some fine motor control, then the constraint induced therapy should kick in and help them you know, improve the, the, the control and, and the function. So in two decades, when we get in our self-driving car and come to work, when we get to work, we'll find robots that are sophisticated enough to follow the brain signals and to provide the necessary counterweight support so that people can exercise on them their own time, yeah. right? Exactly. With FES. That's where it's going. Sure. No. And, and then, do you, in terms of the mechanism of the effect, where is the where are the difference and, and similarities? Do you think that the underlying mechanisms for effectiveness are the same for the two? The, they're very similar. The only thing is, why, for example, why those other therapies don't work in patients who have no function is because uh, in order for you to get a proper set of feedback for muscle spindles, muscle spindles have to have a certain tension. And you cannot impose that tension using robotic systems or constraint-induced therapy or any of those things, right? So when you fire electrical stimulation on a muscle, you're not only generating muscle contraction, but you're also, also contracting the muscle spindle fibers, allowing for the proprioceptive information to come back, velocity and position information. If you don't have that contraction of muscle spindles, any passive movement or movement of the hand provides you gibberish information, if any, to the central nervous system. The central nervous system doesn't recognize what this is, right? So you need to have muscle spindles at some reasonable tension and in order to get a proper set of information about the position of the velocity. And that's what electrical stimulation does, because as we stimulate the muscles to contract them, we also stimulate gamma tract to get muscle spindles at some tension. It's not perfect, no, nobody pretends that it's perfect, or the muscle contraction that we generate, it's not perfect. But at least we heighten the whole system up, right? And as you, as the patient is moving the hand through and through electric, with electrical stimulation assistance, it gets reasonable feedback to the central nervous system. So it will be similar as if I would try to sing something from, you know, Christina Aguilera. It will be terrible. Everybody will hold their ears, but everyone will know that I'm trying to sing one of her songs. And I think that's what we're doing to central nervous system. It's not exactly how. It, used to be, but it's closed, and the central nervous system, ah, okay, that's what she's trying to do. And then it starts incorporating that into the normal process. 
Okay, I guess we've got to wrap it up. Thank you, Milos. That was great. And thanks for including the insights at the end to the other three experiments, which I think are absolutely fascinating, including the potential early signs of curing depression by forcing a smile. Take care. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.